All right, let's go on to the third section in this tutorial, which is about the basic devices and some of their performance characteristics in the terahertz systems and what it means for signal processing people trying to uh, design communication systems with these uh, devices. So if you're scared about terahertz circuits, let me just start by saying that everything you have seen in regular lower frequency circuits at least functionally exists. Well, most everything. I'll, I'll point out a few exceptions. So at least at a very high level, if you're used to a regular communication chain, that is antennas, low noise amplifiers, mixers, so on, you're going to see equivalent circuits in the terahertz. It's just that the scale and performance performance and the way they work is differently and then we have to think a little bit differently when we do signal processing for these circuits. Now some of the challenges I've summarized here is just that most importantly you're just dealing with a much larger number of antennas. Remember that from the propagation section because we need to form very narrow beams. Well of course using these systems by nature to get very wide bandwidths, and that means very high sample rate. And those both tie in to a fundamental issue here, which is power consumption. Overall, the message I'm gonna give you is that you can get performance similar to lower frequencies, but you're gonna pay a price in power, and then the dominant issue is how to trade that off. And I'm gonna to try to give you some techniques for that, and also, some open parts which are not solved, and that's maybe where your research is going to be. And part of that power consumption trade-off comes in because of relatively inefficient devices, and just we'll have to deal with much more non-linearities. So it'll make the signal processing more interesting if you're a mathematical person. Now, what I want to present here is some partial answers to the really kind of basic questions that come out of that. First of all, how do we model RF front ends if you're not a circuit designer and you need something a little more simple and tractable to deal with? I'll give you some hints of that here. Um, how do these front ends perform, uh, perform in the presence of these nonlinearities and what we can do about optimizing their performance and uh, what uh, research questions are open? And what are the trends we can expect in circuits going forward? Okay, I mentioned power consumption is very central. So I want to start off by talking about what we're seeing in power consumption today in commercial 5G systems before we go into uh, terahertz. So there's an excellent paper out now from uh, the University of Minnesota at Twin Cities. They actually published a very good paper earlier last year, and they have a follow-up. This is a collaboration with also Morley Mao's group at University of Michigan. This is a fantastic paper. I recommend it to anyone. Uh, what they did is they took a large number of devices, and they actually did extensive tests on two commercial networks, T-Mobile and um, Verizon. They also instrumented these devices to actually measure all sorts of amazing data, but one thing is just the power consumption for this slide. So what this graph is, is um, on the top, as you increase throughput, what is both the power consumption in the uplink and downlink when you compare, say, a 5G or a 4G system. And if you, I don't know if you can read that uh, left y-axis column, but those numbers are pretty daunting. They're looking at numbers like six to eight watts if you're talking about these throughputs of, uh, you know, in the gigabits per second, uh, uh, gigabits per second for millimeter wave. So you can get those throughputs, but you're paying a very high cost. Just as an example, if you asked people a few years ago what the typical power consumption on a cell phone device would be, they're talking about probably one and a half, two watts. So this is uh, a very daunting number and really um, should implore us to try to figure out ways to try to reduce this number and this is going to be even more challenging as we move to the uh, terahertz um, range. Now one key thing to understand when we think about power consumption is how we're fundamentally addressing the multiple antennas and that relates to this MIMO architecture. Now, there are two kind of traditional ways when you, in the millimeter wave range of thinking about MIMO front ends. You can broadly class them as analog beamforming or digital beamforming. Analog beamforming is what is done pretty much in every commercial 5G system that you have today. So if you were to buy a 5G handset, I'm sure it will have a, essentially a phase ray um, uh, 
B formula. What that does is the following. On the receive side, you have a number of Vantella elements. You will amplify each one, but then you combine do it for the people in RF. That is, you're doing an analog in RF. And then you take that combined signal and go through the rest of the chain, namely the mixer and the um, A to D. The benefit for this over traditional, what you would say, fully digital beamforming, where you um, combine across, you, uh, <clears throat> you digitize each stream separately and then perform the digital, the beamforming digitally, is that you are saving power in the RF section because you are hopefully removing the number, reducing the mixers down to one and the number of ADCs down to one. That is why analog beamforming is the design of choice today for millimeter wave systems. But it comes at a price. The price is that you can only look in one direction at a time. So that's very costly if you're if a base station and need to serve multiple users. They get around that by doing something called hybrid beam forming, where they combine in multiple directions. Or you're a mobile device and you either want to support spatial multiplexing or you want to be able to do beam search for uh, mobility tracking. So there's a cost, but there's already a benefit. There's a cost in terms of performance, but there's a potential benefit in terms of power. So that is the kind of conventional wisdom that we have for millimeter wave. But throw that all out, or maybe when we go above 100 gigahertz. As I said, commercial systems right now, like your 28 gigahertz 5G phone that you can buy in the store has a commercial, and usually has an RF phase shifter. But if we look at what's happening in 100 gigahertz, what we're seeing is that RF phase shifting is not, at least right now, practical. Let me just give you an example from Gabriel Rabiz's group in UC San Diego, which they just um, published. Here's a 2021 paper. So this somewhat complicated diagram is a eight element, uh, 140 gigahertz phase rate. Now what they do though, is they actually, if you read this diagram correctly, they have a mixer on every RF element. And they basically down convert that down to 28. And then once it's in 28, they actually do an analog phase. They do a phase shifting at this uh, lower RF frequency. And the reason they do this is just because there aren't very good phase shifters, at least yet, at that very high 140 gigahertz range. And they could then reuse a 28 gigahertz phase shifter that they had. But once you do this, you are losing the power benefit or a significant amount of that power benefit that you had from going to RF phase shifting because you're anyway burning one mixer on each one of these streams. Now, the upshot of this is that we have to, uh, well, that fully digital receivers, again, will likely become much more relevant at these 100 gigahertz range, at least until RF phase shifting becomes practical and someone develops a solution around that. Now, it's actually of my belief that even at lower frequencies, they will actually tend to go more toward digital phase shifting because the technology and other techniques we have for power savings in that domain are getting better. And many of you in this uh, talk have worked extensively in this area. So I'm not going to talk about that much here, but it's definitely even more the case above 100 gigahertz. And I know this is an area of research actively on fully digital systems, so that I wanted to mention that here. Now, to talk about the other parts of this, I want to have just one uh, let's call it a reference receiver architecture that I'm going to just use as an example. And this will make some of what I'm going to talk about later concrete because I'll be able to put concrete numbers for it. So just imagine for the remainder of this section, or quite a bit of the remainder, I was interested in building a 140 gigahertz, which is one of those likely sub terahertz bands that are going to be opened up. Um, in, uh, uh, for commercial use. And um, I had these parameters associated with it. So maybe at about uh, 
64 elements, which is kind of reasonable that you would want, and a fully digital design, right? And about eight carriers of about 200 megahertz each. That particular number is coming from the 5G new radio sand. So these are kind of reasonable parameters that you might expect for early sub terahertz systems. And we'll go follow this architecture, which is a fairly conventional architecture, rather than having antennas, a low noise amplifier, some kind of uh, uh, filter, and then an AGC, and then doing some uh, A to D conversion, and then doing all the beam forming in digital. Now, with this picture in mind, let's look at some of the power trade-offs that we would get when we try to build a conventional, fully digital receiver at this frequency. Before we do that, though, we need a way to think about and model non-linear impairments. Because as I'm going to show you very soon, each one of these blocks in that chain has non-linear. So let me step back and give you a very general mathematical model to think about this. So let's say we have a transmitter, and let's just make it very simple. Say it transmits a single scalar symbol, so in one symbol period. And we receive that symbol, it's called X, and with some noise. And it goes to our array, and let's just say it's a single path channel, right? So it has some uh, uh, channel, spatial signature, W. And let's just lump a giant function phi, which is the receiver. And then I'm going to do some receive port forming and I get Z. So we can write this function Z like this, which is just a mathematical expression of this. And this function phi for now is kind of our placeholder for modeling any nonlinear impairments. That could be the ADC, it could be saturation in the receivers. It could also have noise elements to represent receiver noise that would contribute, say, to the noise figure. So the question is, in this very general model, how would this system perform? Well, one very simple way to do this is what you could call looking at the input SNR and the output SNR. So let me explain both these terms. So the input SNR is that receive signal energy to the noise. So if you just grabbed it right before the antenna, if you like, that was the SNR per antenna. But we don't directly grab it right before the antenna. Instead, we go through this mass that we have, which is our antenna array, and also all those nonlinear noisy impairments, and we get this value set. And let's now the question is how well we could decode X from Z. Well, this is a messy nonlinear system. But you can do a very common trick, which is take a linear approximation. And for signal processing people, that is often called the Boschetti approximation, which just says that if I give you any two random variables, I can write one random variable all right, as a linear function of the other plus some uncorrelated noise. That noise might not be Gaussian, but it's uncorrelated. And there's some theory here that if you were to look at it in frequency domain, that noise will be kind of Gaussian. Now, this gives you a lower bound on the capacity, and it's kind of the capacity you would get from a linear receiver, so if we ignore the non-linearities. And now we can look at the relation between the input SNR and output SNR. So if I knew what the input SNR is, that's how good the signal was when it arrived at the antenna, then I can look at the output SNR, and that will tell me how good that signal equalization I'm going to get getting the gains of beam forming, but also all the losses and distortions that happened in my receiver. Now, what does this input SNR to output SNR relationship typically look like? So typically, and I you know the, the, the paper I quoted here um, shows that it kind of has this relation of this function here. So the x-axis is input SNR. The y-axis is output SNR. Now, before you even go into all the details of this, you can sort of real right away you see two distinct regimes for this um, relationship. The first is what you could call the low SNR regime. And if you just do some simplifications, it tells you that the output SNR is some um, factor times in linear scale, 
of the input S0. So you can think of that inverse, that factor having two components. The first part is an increase of the S0 from beam forming, but there is a degradation, which is kind of your conventional noise figure. This is all completely expected. This is what you would get just from traditional linear analysis that you would have taken in any wireless communication class. Have usually noise figure associated with each term, and they contribute um, to the end resulting noise figure when that degrades your performance. But what is interesting is what happens when we go to the very highest sort of regime. And it turns out that at the highest sort of regime, it tends to saturate. And <clears throat> that saturation is happening because as we increase the signal input signal energy, it itself is contributing some distortion. There's a signal dependent distortion, which is proportional to that input signal energy. So no matter how good SNR is, the input SNR, you will not see any resulting benefit whenever there are non-linearities in the system. Now, there are two important takeaways for this, is that we can characterize, even if we have a very complicated non-linear system that have, might have multiple cascades of elements, we can characterize this performance by two numbers. At the low SNR, by this kind of effective noise figure, and at the high SNR by the saturated noise, SNR. The second thing to remember is that for most applications, do not need to have very high SNR. Because at some point, we're only going to transmit, say, 64 QAM, and we're going to use channel coding. So maybe typically more than about 25 dB is not actually beneficial in terms of rate. Now, what that means when we try to think about the design, as even if we have nonlinearities, as long as that saturation SNR is higher than what we need, we can usually uh, get around with it. Okay. That was kind of the general mathematical theory. Now let me go back to terahertz and tell you about some of the power performance trade-offs that you will experience in some of those blocks. As I said, those blocks are all the same. I mean, at least functionally they're the same, but they just have different trade-offs. So let's start on the receiver side with the low noise amplifier. So traditionally, the low noise amplifier has scaling of this is a true at most frequencies, which is the power scales inversely with the um, the uh, noise figure and also proportionally the gain. Now, this was uh, some work by my colleague uh, Jim Bachwalter and his uh, students who had uh, designed various options for a project that we were working on. And you can see that the noise figure, the total power consumption, depending on uh, the amount of nonlinearity and gain, ranges about 5 to 20 milliwatts, which is not, you know, um, not daunting. It's certainly a reasonable number. The more difficult problem, especially on a fully digital design, is the mixer. Let me just say this, that you will see in the millimeter wave research, if you haven't seen it already, there's a huge amount of literature on very power efficient A to, D, A to Ds. But the A to D is not the dominant actual power consumption, at least in cellular bandwidths. Instead, the dominant power consumption in millimeter wave in fully digital architectures is the mixer, which is needed to convert that signal from high frequency down before it hits the A to D. Now, that's actually a complicated function of a number of things, the mixer topology that you use, and the low, it's called the local oscillator, which drives that mixer, right? But this optimization will be key, and I don't have the time to go into the details, but that is the really central bottleneck. But the ADC is also important, and but the ADC, as you might have known, it scales with two factors, right? Which is the sample rate, basically there's an energy every time you run the sample conversion, all right, plus it has this exponential scaling, typically, in the number of bits. Now, what we learned a lot from the millimeter wave, and many of you worked on this, is that if you use low resolution ADC, say about three to five bits, you can get actually very decent performance and significantly reduce the power. And it's for this reason, actually, that after you reduce this power, that the mixer actually becomes dominant. Now, somehow we have all of these knobs 
in these, which trade off the performance affecting both the noise bigger, the non-linearity of that saturated point, and the power, and we want to try to optimize this. This is one optimization, and I think there are other people could play around with this and probably do better that we worked on, which is just simply taking a number of designs from each one of these elements that you have um, in this chain. And this way, these designs come up with my, of my colleague, Jim, who worked all these out in um, a 90 millimeter uh, by CMOS technology. And then picking the one that gives the right trade-off of that noise bigger, end-to-end -end noise bigger, and uh, saturated SNR. I don't want to go through the numbers here in detail, but I just want to point out a couple of things. The first thing is that if you use power optimization, you can get pretty significant savings. So when we first started looking at what is the power consumption, we were getting numbers around 6 to 7 watts. That's what we call this baseline um, numbers here, and depending on the number of antennas. So total power consumption was about 7 watts. And most of that power, at least for a fully digital design, was burnt, almost all of it, in the mixer, right? So that's kind of an indication, as I said before, that the A to D is not, I know that many people work in this area, but the A to D is not the bottleneck. It is the mixer design. By optimizing the mixer, but maintaining a certain reasonable SNR performance, we could dramatically reduce the power consumption, maybe by 70, 80%. And get it in that number of about one and a half um, watts, depending on uh, depending on how many uh, uh, elements you want to uh, support. And these two designs here I've shown here have different trade-offs of like uh, performance. So what's the upshot of this uh, high level is that these nonlinearities are significant, but we can play a game around this, which is that if we're willing to live with nonlinear, the nonlinearities are significant they will manifest themselves as kind of a saturated SNR. And that gives a very simple signal processing um, interpretation. And then knowing that we don't have to get a very high saturated SNR, we can live with nonlinearities and use that with the right models to reduce the power. We can probably, I think there's still space to do even better because what we're doing when we're making these approximations, we're just linearizing those systems out. And I think there will be space for people who can actually even do better around uh, to handle that non-linearity, but I think that is an open area of research. That was the receiver side. I want to point out a couple of other things on the transmitter side. The most important probably is what's happening in the power amplifiers. So this is a really excellent um, paper uh, from a group of European researchers where they, they have really great summary of all the circuits technologies from both 5G and 6G, and one of many graphs in this paper. It has um, the what's called the PSAP, which is the uh, saturated total maximum power that you can get from a single element of a power amplifier for different technologies. So in your cell phone today, the most... Uh, common is actually gallium arsenide, which gives you a very good, um, not just maximum power, but also power efficiency. But as we move to higher frequencies, it becomes very difficult to transmit efficiently large amounts of power. And this will motivate people to look at other technologies. And there are two technologies in particular that are becoming very key for um, terahertz in the power amplifier space, gallium nitride and indium. I'm going to show you, if I have time, actually a board um, with Indian phosphide amplifiers, which are getting about 0.1 watts per element, and gallium nitride, you can expect, can even get um, uh, more, than, uh, <clears throat> more than that. The power efficiency is also somewhat lower, and this is something that we're going to have to deal with here, but that is getting better. Um, every year, and researchers are doing pretty remarkable things to get around this. Now, remember that these power limitations are typically per element, when, of course, an array of elements will be able to combine those, plus we'll get the beam forming gain, so we will actually be able to transmit fairly high powers if we're willing, of course, to spend that power when we come back to the power consumption, but that can actually give us some link budget. 
Okay, that was mostly on the RF side. Let me just quickly talk about a little bit what's happening in the digital side. So I think this is an area that's super exciting for signal processing people because the fully, um, especially if we want to go entertain fully digital beamforming architectures, that becomes a big challenge at these frequencies. Now, beamforming, at least mathematically, is just a matrix multiplication. But when you have to do that matrix multiplication at gigahertz of sample rate across very large number of antenna elements, that becomes a power bottleneck, which can become comparable to those power consumption numbers you are seeing in, your, um, <clears throat> in the RF. And I think there is a large amount of interesting work that you are seeing right now, or we are seeing right now, in optimization in this space. I've just taken one example of this from uh, Christoph Studer's group, which has been doing some fantastic work in this area. One algorithm that he's been looking at is the area of what you could call sparse beam processing, probably very similar mathematical techniques that signal processing people are familiar with because sparsity was so dominant in our field. This is some performance numbers that he would get, the black line being the optimal filter, but if you have this very power efficient system, you get this blue line, you do end up getting kind of comparable performance. Christoph is a remarkable um, engineer and he's actually fabricated a chip for this. I've given you the um, links here, so check that out if you are interested. Another topic that becomes quite important that I think we are a little bit amiss in the signal processing community for not paying as much attention is out of band commissions. So um, on the transmit side, of course, most cellular systems and most RF systems are supposed to operate in a constrained bandwidth. But that they then therefore you need to try to minimize the leakage um, into the adjacent carrier, something called adjacent carrier leakage. On the receiver side, similarly, some transmitter could be transmitting an adjacent band, but they will leak some amount into your band. Now, what makes it difficult at the terahertz frequency are twofold, which are very, um, they're just more extensive versions of, or challenging versions of what we saw in the the first is that if we want to run those great power optimizations, what they are doing is they are basically introducing nonlinear bits. Uh, and we're saying that for the signal in band, we can live with those nonlinearities. But when you introduce these nonlinearities, you're basically reducing the overall dynamic range of your receiver. That means if that there's a strong adjacent carrier, even though it's orthogonal in frequency, it can saturate that receiver, and then once it saturates that receiver, it will start to leak into your bed. And um, this can become a much more significant problem. In fact, if you talk to circuit designers, so if you present them a lot of the work that our community in signal processing has done, like on low resolution ADCs on these low power mixers, they will tell you, oh, I'm not surprised by the fact that your signal can operate at this very low dynamic range. But the issue they are worried about are these adjacent carriers, because those can be much higher, particularly because you can't plan for the locations of those receivers. You could be connected to your cell from your carrier that's very far, but your adjacent carrier could be much closer and could actually leak significantly into this. An additional issue is that typically in conventional, say, sub six gigahertz phones, there's our great RF filters to try to filter out these adjacent carriers, at least on a band level prior to them hitting the RF or digital um, chain. So those are usually things like uh, surface acoustic wave filters and bulk acoustic wave filters. Those right now, from my understanding, are difficult to produce in the millimeter wave range or the terahertz range, at least in a reasonable form factor. And that means that we're just relying on the bandwidth of the antenna, which will generally bring in a lot more of that signal. So that this is a large open area that we need um, to address 
if we want to go into the terahertz band. Let me step one uh, level up, if you like. Talked a lot now about the device level. Let me quickly talk a little bit about um, what can happen at the Mac layer. So on a commercial, uh, either wireless LAN device or a cellular device, the most, uh, at the Mac layer, the best known performance power saving technique is just some kind of form of discontinuous reception. The idea is very simple. You just turn off your receiver when you don't need to listen to something. And you just periodically wake up for, um, for uh, uh, to see if this data for you. And your transmitter knows when you're going to wake up, and this saves an enormous amount of power. That's how your cell phone doesn't, you know, get drained out. In a, you know, it can last the whole day. If it was constantly looking, it would drain out much, much faster. But there are some challenges when we go to millimeter wave or terahertz from using these, mainly because the channel is rapidly changing, and you need to form very narrow beams. You need to wake up not just for data, but you need to wake up to be able to track the channel. And this is another, I think, largely unexplored area that we've looked at a little bit. I don't want to go too much into the uh, um, details here, but basically there would be some kind of optimization of what you want to try to search, as well as actually how to do that search when you wake up. And that is a trait that's kind of a control theory problem, which brings into a lot of other tools that we can end up um, using. Um, I don't want to go through the, uh, oh, maybe I'll just quickly mention some of these um, simulation results in this case. And I just bring this out that you can A, if you use, without going into details, if you use these um, newer algorithms in this context, you can get significant power savings. And that's kind of an interesting other avenue to look at the intersection of what techniques from control theory that we can use when we apply them into these protocols and in the beam forming. The other aspect was that in these particular simulations, these were with blockers following those blockage diffraction models that we had from uh, that first section. So that ties back to needing good models for mobility blockage and other to get uh, the right um, kind of analysis. Another area that's being studied extensively is machine learning techniques, particularly for beamforming. I don't want to talk about this too much because it was largely the same of right now at least of what we're seeing in the millimeter wave, which is a number of great worker or researchers looking at various machine learning techniques for the purpose of beam tracking. Uh, I think that we'll have to see how these operate in the terahertz bands and we'll have to have a better idea of what kind of array sizes we're dealing with. Um, this work was something from my group, but there's many, many other researchers who did some preliminary simulations of tracking these things at 140 gigahertz. And some of these more machine learning techniques can play a role, but I think we'll actually need more real data to say that conclusively one way or the other. All right, that kind of wraps up uh, this section. Let me just try to give a kind of summary of this, what I quickly went through. So first of all, power consumption is really significant challenge. And in some ways it encapsulates, if you like, all the issues that you have with that terahertz receiver or transmitter, um, because it, it arises from the fundamental aspects of these uh, features that poor device efficiency, the wide bandwidths and the large number of arrays, but it also is a good metric by which we can try to think about um, optimizing our signal processing algorithms. Now, I think there's, it's pretty early right now, this field, but there's, I think, a very lot of interesting research directions in this area um, that is trying to really operate in these, pushing these devices to the nonlinear array regime. I think I'd love to see future research, which actually looks at the nonlinear signal processing um, methods for this. There's also at the baseband side, 
a lot of efficient array processing. Let me actually just on that point note out that if you look at, for example, what happened in hardware um, just a few years ago with all the uh, interest in deep learning, you saw a real lot of interest of people looking at various types of hardware accelerators and new GPU designs to try to handle these massive machine learning computations. I very much think that this same kind of brain power can be put towards looking at 5G, 6G type uh, devices. And on that note, also we're seeing a lot of, I think there will be even more interest in machine learning techniques because they offer a way to handle these kind of complex um, problems. Final thing that I think um, I might offer is that, for at least for me, what was very useful as uh, someone who's more into phi and calm theory was that I benefited a lot from great collaborations, both circuit designers and digital designers, as well as people who also know the upper parts of that protocol stack. And I think these kind of collaborations can be useful. So if you have people, have collaborators, you know, really seek them out. So that wraps up this section, and then we're going to move on to talking about what we can do with all this technology in the use cases.